All right, my name is Joe Bailey and I teach physical education at GCFR Senior High School in Western Wisconsin. And today I'm gonna to be sharing uh, my journey towards meaningful PE. Now, before we get going, um, I wanna say a huge thank you to the Physiotagogy uh, team, Naomi, Jonathan, Jorge, Sarah, Adam, Colin, and uh, Phil Bodie, because without them, this wouldn't be happening. And this is, if you've um, participated in one of these before, you'll know that there's always great content. And the beauty of it is that you can always go back whenever you are ready and uh, check out sessions. And you know, I found myself over the years jumping back to sessions from four or five years ago because there's something I wanted to check out or was uh, now interesting to me. So massive thank you to them. Um, it's great that given, even given this crazy situation we're all in right now, we can do this. Okay, so first of all, um, a little, little bit about me. Uh, my journey begins kind of in the center over here in the United Kingdom. That's where I'm originally from. But I, uh, me and my family moved over to Hong Kong when I was 11. I grew up there, went to school there. A um, Couple of pictures from Hong Kong over here. As you can see, you've got anything from center of the city all the way to gorgeous beaches. And then in 2004, we moved to uh, Warsaw, Wisconsin, which I think I've got this kind of geographically okay. Didn't have the states marked, and that makes it a bit more difficult. Um, and I teach at D. Severus Senior High School, which is a grade 10 through 12 high school. So that is basically, if you were from the UK, that would be grades um, years 11 through 13. And basically, if I'm uh, not at school, I'm probably running around somewhere doing races or playing in the park, doing some geocaching and so on. So that's my kind of uh, journey to where I am right now. But what we're going to be talking about today, if I can go the right way, is how my whole journey into, towards meaningful PE came about. So I'd say about four or five years ago, I read these two books, Made to Stick and Contagious. And they are kind of like marketing books. They're talking about what it is that makes something catch on for people, um, that they want to take notice, they want to do it, they want to buy it and so on. And I thought, as I was reading this, I was thinking, you know what, this is exactly what we want for physical education um, and what they said in these books are social currency is one thing so when you know something and you share it with somebody else you get a little bit of kudos which is nice um, people often rely on triggers so when you hear something or see something it reminds you of what you're going to do anything when you can pin some emotion to it it means it's more likely to be memorable and therefore perhaps more likely to be repeated and obviously we ideally would like those emotions with a positive nature Practical value, if something's useful to you, then great, you may as well tell somebody else about it, and then hopefully they can benefit from that too. Um, something is visible, it's public, it's out there, you can see it, it's more likely to catch on. And who doesn't love a good story? Stories can wrap up so many different elements of knowledge and they help deliver this message. So I was thinking, well, you know what, if sales people, marketing, they're, they're using these tactics, isn't this exactly what we want to be doing in physical education? Because to be honest, we want our content to catch on. We want the, um, the willingness to lead a healthy, active lifestyle you know, forever to catch on with our students. Um, and even if we didn't realize it, you know, we are actually, we, we are teachers, we are educators, but we're selling every single day that we're in that classroom and you know, in our wider lives and society, we're always selling the importance of health and well-being. And ultimately, you know, when my students walk out of our high school that's their last opportunity for physical education um, i'm lucky in my state where students have to take a credit and a half of p at high school but in, i know in some in some places they may only get one semester or one year of physical education in their high school career but i need to make sure they leave with that physical activity ticket saying i've got this i know what i can do for myself i um i know how it feels for me and I'm willing to go out and explore and do all sorts of fun things in the environment wherever I am in the future. So we want to be using some of these sales pitches. And then this kind of developed further because after I sort of started to use some of these ideas in PE, I came across the Meaningful PE framework, um, which is the work of um, Dr. Scott Kretschmar and it's been continually developed by um, Tim Fletcher, uh, Didier Nee Cronin, Cronin, I hope I have pronounced her name properly, um, Steph Benny and, and many others. And what they contend that in order for PE to be meaningful to our students, there are several different uh, pieces that form that. So the first thing is improved physical competence. So if we 
feel that our skills are improving and getting better, there's more chance that we're like, I feel good about this. I want to do it in the future. Um, the, the what's in it for me part, the personally relevant learning. So if you can make that connection, say, I get that. I can use that. All right, I'm sold. Then we can make that connection for our students. Challenge. Think of it like Goldilocks. You know, she found a chair that was too big, a chair that was too small, and one was just right. Challenge needs to be the same. You want to make sure that nothing is too easy because then it's like, meh, so what? And you don't want something that's too hard where it's just like, I can't do this, I give up. So find that sweet spot of challenge. That makes it more meaningful. You've all, I'd say we've all probably experienced that part where we've had that sweet spot. And we've, you know, it's been a bit of a struggle along the way. We've accomplished something and then we're like, yes, awesome. Which leads us on to delight. This is a tricky one. Um, tough to define, really tough to measure. But those kind of like moments that take you by surprise, like, wow, that was, you know, that, that overawing feeling of I'm really loving what I'm doing right now, which again, it's really hard to encapsulate exactly what that looks like, feels like, or sounds like, because it does vary from person to person. And you don't necessarily know when it's going to happen. Um, fun you just you know you're enjoying what you're doing and then lastly um social interaction making sure that you are with people you're able to work with them and it is a positive experience now i'm going to speak a little bit more to four five and six here because something that i found really useful um as i've kind of developed as a teacher is cooperative learning and this really does speak to the social interaction piece and to be honest if we've got this piece then there's probably going to be more fun. There's probably going to, be, going to be more delight. And maybe that challenge will also feel more right as well. So cooperative learning is a teaching structure and has five main features. Um, it involves face-to-face -face interaction. So you're working with a group of people and you're having to interact with each other. It involves you as a group having to process ideas and things with each other. So everyone's kind of using their collective brain power because, you know, I might have an idea, my friend's got an idea, someone else has a third perspective, we put them together, we all win. Positive interdependence. This is where I might have one role within a group and then someone has got another role, but each of our roles has to come together to make what we're doing work. Interpersonal small group skills. So I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, I'm working in five. I do my bit, come back and help the group. And individual accountability. I might have a specific job to do. If I don't do my job, the whole group will get let down. So cooperative learning is a big part of creating positive social interactions. And as I'm talking about what I've done with Meaningful PE, I'll show you how I've also used some of cooperative learning structures to help kind of underpin um, and help hopefully what I'm trying to do for my students, which is create a Meaningful PE experience for them. Now, the last thing that um, kind of goes into this whole bucket of trying to make things meaningful for me is thinking about the um, effective side and how physical activity can make us feel. Because if I can create experiences where, for example, um, you know, when you are, you feel like you're respected and recognized, well, I can do that with cooperative learning because you have a role in there, then that's more likely to have that, you know, that feel good serotonin going, or perhaps when someone does something nice for me in a group, a little bit of oxytocin, the whole the hug hormone, um, that satisfaction accomplishment that comes when we've overcome a challenge, we've managed to work with each other. Um, when you're working in a group and you're laughing and that releases endorphins. So if I can kind of think about as I'm designing my learning experiences, am I planning for these to potentially be released or that effect to happen to my students? That's going to make a difference too. All right. So moving on. So what I decided to do, and I've done a few elements of this before, was to undertake some action research and to look in a little bit more deeply and more thoroughly into um, if I was doing right by my students with a meaningful PE framework. Now, for anyone who is not familiar with the action research cycle, it's basically a continual ongoing learning process whereby you know, you've, got, you've got your idea, you plan what you're going to do, it happens, you go back and look and say, okay, did it work, did it not work? reflect and then you repeat that cycle so it's continuous learning and the, the ultimate goal you know for me as a teacher i walked out as a naive 21 year old started teaching thinking i don't have to learn anything else um, and in reality i had really only just learning every day when i'm teaching i'm learning something so you know this might be one big cycle but even within this every day there's always an element of small little cycles that are going on because you're constantly thinking or hopefully you're constantly thinking about 
what am I doing? How is it going? What can I change? Sometimes you have to change things in the moment because the weather's changed, someone's taken your space and so on. But it's always good to then look back and reflect and think, right, did that work? What do I want to do next? What have I learned? How am I going to move forward? So that's the action research cycle. Oops, let me back up a second. Before, however, I dove into looking at this research within this badminton unit, I want to tell you what we've done in terms of prior learning, because it wasn't just a, we just dove straight in and everything was great, because that's not the way it works. So prior to this particular unit, we had already established a whole um, lot of um, content had been covered. Um, most importantly, we'd, we'd established relationships in the class. So I always start off with a, a kind of an uh, us, not us. So what does each individual class want to see in their class? That's the us part and versus the not us part. The no, this is not about us. We don't want to see these actions, behaviors, et cetera, in class. Um, we have several things that we like to spot, that we spiral through our curriculum. This in particular is a fitness for life curriculum. It is a, it's a core class that all students will take generally as a grade 10 or a 15, 16 year old. And it kind of lays the foundation for a lot of other physical, physical education experiences that students can have at DC Everest. So to that end, there are several um, contact knowledge pieces that we spiral throughout the curriculum. And the first one is the stages of learning. So first of all, understanding how we learn is really, really important because it isn't just a case of I'm good at something or I'm not. It's when you're learning, it can be messy. You know, you make a load of mistakes, then you finally get the hang of it in that associative stage. And eventually, the time, well, most of us get moved towards the autonomous stage in various levels. You, you know, you can kind of do things a little bit more without having to invest so much brain power. You're, you're experiencing more success. Or we'll talk about goal setting. Um, how to make something specific, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and having a timeline to it. Um, we'd already done some cooperative learning in terms of a, a group using the student team's uh, achievement division, that's the STAD challenge, where each group, um, they had a pedometer, they did their individual thing, they made a goal based on their individual activity, and then as a group, they tried to work together to, to meet that goal. So each individual person was responsible for to contributing for the, to the group's overall success. And then finally, other social connections that we'd made, uh, meet and greet, so getting to know each other a little bit more, learning how to use each other as resources for content. So that we're like, I've got a person I'm, I worked at some lunges with, and then we have a little chat about what we like physical activity wise. Again, it could be a, gosh, I like this. Wow, I don't know anything about that. Tell me about that. Or I didn't know I had this in common with this, this, this student here. Um, I love the scale of one to 10 that I got from Chip Candy and John Smith. You just, you just put out some cones or markers and you ask your class, okay, um, um, I like music and they will spread themselves out from you know scale of one to 10, depending on how much they like it. Interesting to see how polarizing some of those things are. Um, and they realize that, gosh, I'm, I'm a person, I'm an artistic person. And so these people in my class, I wasn't aware of that. Good way to, to get them to, to see what commonalities they have and what differences they have with each other. And then lastly, um, daily mission cards. So checking with each other, asking each other what they're looking forward to, um, what they're going to try and do really well for, just some reflection questions to help kind of guide those social connections ahead of time. So we'd already done all these things, you know, and, and done various iterations of them several times before we got to a badminton unit. So the overall timeline for this, um, and again, we generally we've got about seven to 10 days, depending on, you know, any sort of things that go, curveballs that come in like weather or uh, the time of year, um, assemblies that get thrown in. But in general, I tend to start off with look revisiting stages of learning. So where are we at today? Uh, do cover some basic shots and how to score and serve. My goal ultimately is to, to show them badminton on a huge spectrum from the kind of the very formalized official version where we're playing by the rules. We are scoring correctly. We're serving correctly. We're recognizing you know, different court movements, different strokes are played all the way up to the other end of the spectrum where, you know what, I'm outside right now. I can go stick up a big couple of, you know, rope between two trees and we're just going to play backyard badminton and everything else in between. So over the course of the unit, they were going to experience several different types of badminton, each of which had a meaning behind it. But hopefully they were going to gain some 
um, meaningfulness from a signal word. All right, so that's our overall timeline. Back up a second here, there we go. So like I said, the first thing that we started off with the stages of learning, that's like, here's your check-in today. Where are you at with badminton? So my students, they, they're coming in, that some of them already know that they've struggled with this in the past. They're trying to underhand serve and they're finding they're missing it. So I've got to try and help them with that. More than anything, it's a case of, here's where I'm at today. I'm gonna to see at the end of the unit how far I progress because hopefully I will have developed some improved physical, uh, physical competence in this. Um, and it's relevant to me because I know now that, hey, there's some different serves that I can do and tactically this could help me in the game. And hopefully a bit of a challenge as well. If I'm trying to make sure that my, my backhand serve is going just below the net and it's landing just before the short service line, then just on the short, short service line, then that's gonna be a bit of a challenge for me as well. So kind of an early check-in, where am I at? What, 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 what sort of level am I at right now? Um, one of the next things we move into is that co whole cooperative piece where if we're working with each other, we're gonna get that social interaction. Um, again, because we're designed as a challenge, hopefully physical competence will improve along the way. Um, there hopefully will be some fun. I put a question mark in delight there because again, you can never know if delight is going to happen or not to an extent. However, with these particular challenges, I'm just gonna go and grab my little prop here. Um, you know, each student has a racket, there might be a group of four or five. And as you can see, I kind of, I tried to set them up and this is not in the full order here, um, in sequential order. So it starts off with 10 hits in a group. So I've got to go, next person goes. Every single person has to be involved. So there's some planning in there as well and some interaction that's required in order for them to figure out, well, what is the best? Maybe I know I'm not a great server, but I'm good when the shuttle's in the air. Um, so being able to communicate their strengths and weaknesses as well. As it gets harder down, it could be okay, we're hitting over the net, this time I'm gonna switch hands each time I'm hitting it. And again, everyone has to hit it. And then going down to there's only one racket between a pair, or maybe you have three on one side of the net. So I have to hit it and I pass it to my partner who's got to hit it and we've got to get to the next person who's got to hit it. So we're working on court movement, we're working on communication. Um, and obviously you're hoping that with the skill, sometimes things go according to plan, sometimes they don't. Now this is a cooperative learning structure called numbered heads together, which basically means you're putting everyone's noggins together and thinking of the best strategy to overcome this. And as you can see, I asked the students to kind of, you know, keep a tally of how many uh, attempts it took them to complete them and for some of them some of them of course with this first one where it's just you know 10 hits backwards and forwards um, they might have completed it on the first try other groups however might have struggled with this one it took them eight or nine att you know attempts to complete not really through anyone no one was you know trying to screw up but just took them that long um, but maybe it's one of the harder ones they may have actually you know excelled at but what was interesting to me observing this and um, circulating while the students were trying this was when they had hit that sweet spot of we didn't get it first time but we're also not frustrated was the the verbal like yes when they had actually completed a challenge that was an indicator to me all right i think we might be on the right track here in terms of you know hitting the right challenge level and also adding that little sprinkle of delight of we've got it awesome you know that, that, that feel good factor so going back to those happy chemicals, that sense of accomplishment, that uh, little dopamine hit. Um, oops. Um, the other thing that I had to have students do is also do another little reflection piece, um, plus Delta. Uh, my principal who um, has been out of school for a couple of years now, he brought this to us when he came and he always asked us to look at right, what's going well and then what can we improve on? So again, identifying as a group, what are we doing that's working um, well for us right now? What for the next challenge that we're going to be trying could we do better with? You know, could um, you know, is it better for this person to go first, or oh, you know what, you only got a couple of hits in that round, maybe we need to rotate things around a little bit more. So, again, you know, making sure they've got that reflection piece in there as well to realize that we, you know, if we work together, we're probably going to achieve a whole lot more. Um, another one that we did within the unit was trying to look at again, thinking about. You know, being more tangible about where you're hitting the shuttle, not just, you know, the old uh, hope and pray overhead clear. They're actually starting to think about, well, if my opponent's here, where should I then try and hit the shuttle instead? So in a group, looking at a couple of people playing and a couple as, you know, uh, peer observers who are looking to see 
if they are managing to at least attempting to try and hit the shuttle away from their opponent um, or not and having a couple of rounds of that with feedback and then the other one um, was to look at the scoring you know were they you know before the server was about to serve saying okay okay it's uh two three um, were they serving from the right side were they serving diagonally as well so looking at improving physical competence here adding a little challenge in terms of you know are you remembering to do this are you actually thinking about okay where can i move my opponent to next and social interaction because the feedback piece is there and that's a cooperative learning structure known as pair check and perform so you've got a couple of people they check they give the feedback and then the performance aspects in there as well Oops. team badminton again we're looking to enhance and, and, and add a little bit of a spin onto badminton so with um regular rule structure i put students into groups of approximately five now you know it's like with groupings there's always going to be somebody away in some way shape or form but the idea with this is that as a team they had to decide how they wanted to split themselves up so i might play with sam um, and then the next time, the next into round two, I've already played with Sam once, so I don't get to partner with Sam again. Maybe I'm going to play with Bob this time because we haven't been partners yet. And maybe Kat um, is in a double pair up first round and in the second round, because of numbers, she might be in a single pair up as well. So everyone's getting to play with each other and think about their strengths and weaknesses, but more importantly, how they can support each other best. Because this is another example of the student team's achievement division structure, whereby let's say a team, um, they split into three different matches and we add the score up at the end. Now I've got an example on the next slide for you. So let's take the green team here. Um, yellow team have got five people. Um, so the green team, so they've split up into two doubles matches here and they've also got a singles match going on. Now, if you have a look at the scores at the bottom, Yellow won the singles match 21 to 12. Uh, they lost the first doubles match here 17 to 6. They just snuck a victory in the third doubles match. But because it's everyone working together, if you add up the scores in this particular situation, Green actually won by one point. So even though that singles person had won, every single point that they got was counting towards the overall team total. Um, and the red situation over here. You know what? Sometimes numbers don't line up. One, one group has a group of six. Red team happens to be, you know, have a student who's away today. It's a good, good opportunity for students to realize that when things are not going exactly as you planned, you know, what do we do? Do we stop and give up or do we modify and just work within it? So sometimes you do have a situation where, you know, two might be against one, which guess what? Up to the challenge level sometimes means the singles person might rise to the occasion and really outperform themselves um, but also it gives you know this group all right how do we want to split ourselves up so that we the person who's by themselves is you know feeling comfortable in what they're doing so within um, team badminton they're playing they're working on those skills they're putting them into practice the element of challenge is okay how are we going to you know mix ourselves up how are we going to win the points so our team can win overall um, hopefully it's fun and obviously there's social interaction there because they're continually after each round having to decide, right, who's now going to work with whom, um, cheering each other on, supporting each other, especially when things don't go their way. Very, very important. Um, the next one, another one that I've done as a kind of a reflection piece with, um, with teams is a self and group assessment. Now I got this one from Jorge Rodriguez. Excuse me for a second. Jorge um, is teaching at the Cal School in Saudi Arabia. And I think it was on the, um, the Voxcast podcast. And he mentioned how he was, in his teaching, he was asking his students, you know, how did you show your teammates that you are someone they want to work with? And then on the flip side, how did you show the team you're playing against that you are a person or, uh, that you would like, they would like to play against? Because let's face it, you know, you want people to want to work with you. And you want another team to have an enjoyable experience playing against you because that way, maybe they'll want to engage in a, um, an activity with you again in the future. So again, making that reflection piece, like, okay, personally relevant, what can I do? What am I doing to demonstrate? That's, that, that duty is on me. Um, 
And also, again, that social interaction, how, you know, why is it enjoyable to play against certain teams more so than others? What are they doing? Recognizing that um, what those pieces look like. So hopefully that then for themselves in the future, they can repeat that again. All right, I think I've got one or two more of these to go through now. Oops, there we go. Now, towards the end of the badminton unit, I nearly always cul culminate in street badminton. Now, what this means is this is the, you get to decide how you want to do this. Now, you've got to come to an agreement in terms of rules. So each group, they were to, able to choose their groups in this situation as well. So a group of um, four or five or possibly even six, um, you as a group, first of all, meet and you determine what rules you're going to play by. My main criteria for this is, you know, it has to include everybody. There's no two people are sitting out while three people are playing. Um, and it can't be dangerous and it can't potentially injure anybody or damage equipment. So they have just, they decide on their rules and then they get to play. Now, the nice thing about this is it's relevant to them because they, they're getting to choose. They're getting to decide what they want to do because guess what? While some of my students might want to play recreational badminton in the league and know how to score, a lot of them, they're not going to go there. But if they feel comfortable coming up with rules that they know are enjoyable to them when they're in a backyard or, you know, the opportunity comes up to play, then fantastic. They can make it work for them, which is the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. Now, this, you know, social interaction, of course, they're interacting with people they want to. Um, the fun and delight. Now, this was one that is, it has always been a huge hit with the students because they're not now pinned in by, oh gosh, the pressure of serving and what if I miss and what if I, what if I um, don't get it where it wants to go. So we've had students who have chosen to have, you know, only what, use only one racket or like, you know what, you can serve underhand, you can serve overhand, it's entirely up to you. Um, I had some students decide they wanted to play with the end of the racket instead of the other end. One decided they wanted to play with their hands or they could use their hand and the racket could be here and they use my hand, someone else is using their foot. So really to see them being creative and thinking about making it their own is huge. Okay, so, so, so that's kind of like how the whole unit went. Now, this is the part that I was most interested in. So I'm thinking I've planned this unit out. Uh, I, I've thought with, you know, the different uh, pieces of um, meaningful PE in mind, like am I creating personal relevance, social interaction, challenge, and so on. But really, I've got to find out from the students what this is. So I tried to put a reflection piece together. And again, it's, it's, it's tough to quantify what each statement is. And I struggle initially to try and make a statement that kind of captured different parts of meaningful PE. But as you can see there, like the first um, one is talking about skill improvement. So that's your improved motor competence, learning about the stages of learning. Um, that's more of the personal relevance part, the fun, challenges in there, a couple of challenge questions. Um, the, probably the hardest one was the, the number six there, that um, some activities that I really enjoyed or surprised me. I wasn't really wasn't quite sure how to ask a question that might talk about delight. Um, so I wanted them all to kind of go back and have a look. And I, you know, I had to re-explain like, here's what we've done or why we've done this to help them remember everything that they've been through. And then what they really enjoy about it and what other comments and suggestions they have. Now, first mistake I'll tell you I made is that they're all done on paper. And of course, to try and analyze anything on paper takes a whole long time. So tip number one for me in the future would be to probably have them do it using a Google form. Although, however, in terms of you know, time and some, it was very quick for the students to be able to do it on a piece of paper as well. So a bit of a mixed one then. Who's, you know, do I want to save myself time or save time in class? Tricky one. So here's what I uh, found out. So first of all, um, one was the um, lowest score. So like, no, I didn't feel my badminton scores improved, improved at all. Five was, oh yes, absolutely. They, they really improved and very impressed. So as you can see here, fives and fours um, represented most of the students. So I think got to about so what, 70 or over 70% said yes, they improved their joining unit. So good. So that part, I guess I can put a check mark there in terms of that. Then next up, uh, personally relevant learning. So what some is going to be useful to me. This is a little bit more of a mixed bag. Um, so, you know, do I see how understanding stages of learning is going to benefit me? Like keeping that in my mind when I'm learning something new. Do I see how like through the, the, um, the team challenges, 
that each one was specific and measurable and you know, hopefully achievable and relevant and it had a timeline attached to it. Do I see how using different serves in the game could help me? And that I could potentially use it again. So again, the vast majority of students felt that yes, this was something that they could use again. Um, some were like it's about 10, 15, 15% were like, mm, not quite so much, but that's okay. And then moving on, fun. Um, this was over overwhelming success. Um, you know, when you've got eighty percent of your students saying yes, then I'm pretty sure we uh, pretty pleased in the fact that we uh, met the mark on that one. Challenge, different levels of challenge. So again, I had to explain what the different challenges I tried to provide were and explain what I tried to do with those. And for the most part, you know, sixty five percent or so um, thought that they had experience challenge and. Um, only sort of, you know, five or seven, seven and a bit percent felt that they weren't that challenged, which is fine too. That's enough to me to kind of dig a little deeper and find out why, what could I do for the, those students that, what did I miss um, for them that I could have possibly provided. Um, the Goldilocks zone, was I able to find challenges that were just right, not too hard, not too easy? For the most part, yes. Uh, only seven percent felt that was not quite the case. Um, the delight, again, this is a really tricky one, but you know, I saw elements of this, but, and I try, as I explained this to students, I tried to say like, you just like, oh my gosh, I'm just really enjoying what I'm doing right now. This is great. Um, so that was overall pretty good too. Uh, oops, social interaction. Um, there was the opportunity to socially interact with, their, with your with classmates. That was pretty good too. 75 or so percent were, yep, uh, they felt so quite strongly so. And then, Lastly, and this one I was really, really pleased with because I think in any, any group situation, you want those interactions to be positive. And we all know that um, in any situation, people can sometimes not be very nice to each other, whether they mean to or not. And school, that can happen a lot. So to, to the fact that nobody felt that they had negative interactions with each other um, was really, really good. And I'm hoping part of the fact that we've done that groundwork just to start off with to establish what that looks like sounds like feels like and we would work on some of that development in there as well so overall i was pretty pleased with how the feedback that i got now the other bit the sort of more extensive feedback and obviously some students chose not to write something and some did um interesting that a lot of them said interest interacting with classmates they didn't know was it was you know was it really enjoyable um street badminton was a massive hit which I'd seen from the reactions of the students when they were making up their rules and deciding what was working for them and then morphing it into a different version when they played a second time. Um, playing with friends was another big one, not surprising. And then, you know, you've got King of the Court, uh, different games, different versions of games. A little bit of overlap there, but I wanted to put that down. And um, a few mentioned they enjoyed playing as part of a team as well. And in terms of what I could do to make it better, there weren't a ton of suggestions here. And again, it could be because they couldn't think of anything. It could be because they didn't want to write anything else down. I'm not sure. Um, but interesting enough, you know, choosing their own teams is a big one. And also being able to choose one person they want to play with. Now, I generally do not um, let students pick their partners in groups because I know what happens. You tend to get people who are left out. You tend to have disparities in ability levels. So, and I explain this to students as well, you know, I never want any student in any of my classes to feel like they have been left out in a situation. Um, however, with the street badminton, it was like, yes, please, you know, I would like you to get into a group of your choosing. Please invite people into your group so that everyone has a group they want to be with. Numbers, it could be four, it could be five, it could be six. Um, then you can go from there. So that's a tricky one as well. And it's, it's always, groupings are always hard to find the balance in um, making sure that you've got students who are going to help support and lift each other up. And that kind of goes back to the, the question earlier, you know, what were you doing to show other people that you were a good person to be on a team with? Well, that's it right there. Oops, let me back up a second. Um, on the teammates front, I just want to mention one thing. Um, I've used various apps and things before in the past to create teams. I used to use Team Shake, but now I just use uh, Classroom Teammates by Adosio because I can get my... I used to do classroom as well. I can import them really quickly from there. But the nice thing is I can make a team and I can keep those teams, save them, and I can drag and drop students from one team to another if I need to in the middle, whereas with a team shape, you can't do that. So if you never looked at a 
any of apps to sort out teams like this. This one's particularly helpful. Um, you can also balance and make sure that, you know, behind the scenes you've set it up so this person will not be working with that person or this person will be working with another person as well. So you can do a little bit of behind the scenes manipulation as well. All right, little side note. Okay, so moving forward. Um, I was pretty pleased with the overall results of it. Um, had we not been sent home for at home physical education for the rest of the year, um, I would have been repeating this process in class. And I was looking forward to seeing again that process continue and see how it was going to evolve. I am going to do it though for what I've been doing while my students have been at home at home because I've been working really hard to make sure that whatever I am giving them for their at home physical education that it is personally relevant. Um, some elements are going to improve motor confidence. There is some challenge in there. So it's, it's obviously been a lot harder to do that, but I want to make sure that more than anything, there's the personal relevant piece. They um, have got some of that with what they've been doing at home. Um, I fully intend to keep, look, you know, always revisit whatever I'm doing in my curriculum um, through that meaningful PE lens and kind of, you know, whatever I'm planning for, looking through that little checklist of, you know, uh, social interaction, delight, fun, competence, challenge, and improve motor competence and see, am I hitting those ones? Am I going get to get, get them all with everything I do? No. But generally, there should be two or three checked off by almost everything that we're doing. Um, exploring more cooperative learning structures. Like I said, I mentioned a few in there. The, the fair share perform, um, the student team's achievement division, numbered heads together, Jigsaw is another one I've used numerous times. But there's so many that lend themselves to creating that kind of group environment that's going to be positive for everybody. Um, I mentioned already that my daily collection of, you know, if I can use Google Forms, I'm, we're fortunate I am a school that is one-to-one -one devices. So um, my students have all got iPads. They don't always know where those iPads are, mind you. Um, but that's something I could do to make it um, quick access to data. Um, but more than anything, to keep evolving get this cycle from here it's not a, okay that's done i'm finished now now it's a game what can i do next what can i do next because you know throughout my teaching it's got to keep evolving because i don't know i'm never ever going to be done with trying to ensure that young people are turned on to the want the desire to go out there and be physically active and find out what works for them and, um, and do things and be willing to go out and explore what's out there for themselves and ultimately for me, um, you know, there's always something bucks along the way. You try something, it doesn't work. You've got to redo it. You've got to, you know, not every, group's, not every group will work together. And more than anything, you know, every time that something doesn't quite go right, it's like, that's fine. What am I going to learn from this? And then how am I going to get back up, dust myself off and carry on again? And I kind of try to use that in pretty much everything that I'm doing. It's okay. There's another good one from Confucius is fall down, fall down seven times, get up eight. So if we're doing that and, you know, we can tell our students that as well, great for growth mindset, then that's going to help them in no matter what they're doing, where they're going. All right. Now resources There's a whole, oopsie, back up a second. Now I'm going the wrong way. Oh, there we are. Um, there's a whole list of resources here that you might find helpful. So first of all, the learning about meaningful physical education website that uh, Tim Fletcher and company have, they're always adding to it. There's blogs, there's research articles, there's all sorts of really great information there. Um, Dr. Ash Casey, um, he's actually, he co-wrote this book with um, Ben Dyson, awesome book for learning more about cooperative learning structures. But he's recently made an entire playlist of different cooperative learning structures explaining what they are. So worth diving into. Mel Hamada's done um, a lot of reflective work into meaningful physical education. Own Sporticus has always got amazing content uh, in terms of analyzing, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, I've mentioned the daily mission cards I used earlier. There's a link to them there. And then lastly, but not least, um, the, the different activities that I kind of went through um, within this presentation, I put them in a Google folder for you to copy if you want to use them for yourself and your program. Uh, if you just click on that link, all you would need to do is then uh, hit file, make a copy, and then you will have your own personal copy to edit however you would like to. So I hope that has given you a little insight into my journey into Meaningful PE, um, what I've been trying to do and you know, things that have worked and 
things I want to still improve on in the future. All that needs to be left to say is thank you. And if I can be of any help, um, any way, shape or form to you in the future, then please feel free to reach out to me. You can find me at, um, at Love Fayette on Twitter, or you can drop me an email there, by the way, with email. If you don't hear back from me within like a day, just send another email and saying, hey, I sent you an email, because sometimes I get buried and I would hate to not respond to somebody just because I happen to not see it in time. So thank you very much. I hope that was helpful and I look forward to learning from you and seeing if I, this, is, this has been the fun for you. Thanks.